Yeah. 
Come on, come on. 
are testing the mics. I'm trying to see if we got any volume here. Thank you all for waiting. Thank you all for waiting. We appreciate your time. Keep checking your time. Checking your time. Thank you for allowing us to wait.
in your white hymnal. In your white hymnal, page 66. Come and dine. If I can get a little know? intro. All right, here we go. Micah test, one, two, three.
Amen. Amen. Brother Jared, will you give us a loud prayer for all of us? Yes. Please, Father, amen. Get the glory, Father. Amen. 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 You may be seated. It's set Pastor Soche. All right. Would Evangelist Soche come forward and preach the word of God for us? Amen. Thank you so much for coming, sir, all the way here. Amen. Welcome to California, man. <laughs> amen. Good to have you over, sir. You think you got that? You want me to help? No. All right. Thank you, brother. Amen. It's good to be here. Amen. Good to be called to preach. Amen. Good to have something to say. I thank you for your <clears throat> pastor inviting me. I thank you for all of you that contributed to, uh, to what was necessary to uh, get this revival going, and especially for the sacrifice you've had in prayers and finances and all the things that, went, that go into doing this. Uh, I'd like a special th thanks to uh, Max for being yes. such a willing servant and doing anything we asked him to do. He was very good at it. And uh, I thank him for that. I, I, uh, I was taking some pictures just a little while ago, and the pastor said, aren't you kind of old to be doing that? <laughs> well, under some circumstances maybe, but uh, I've never gotten over my salvation. That's, uh, that's what keeps me going. I, I don't particularly pay much attention to anything else, and I don't dwell on many things except for the fact that I'm saved, and uh, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him, and uh, I thank God for that. Um, I've never regretted having gotten saved. I've never met anybody that did regret getting saved, and... Uh, I have seen some people in my lifetime that regretted giving their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. They must have regretted it because they're not in good spiritual condition. You know, I figure that you have to be, um, well, you, you really are deceived, but colloquially, I'd like to say they're just half crazy. Uh, if you don't give your life to someone that says he loves you, and he's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He can do all things. Why wouldn't you turn your life over to somebody like that? Because, you know, the truth of the matter is, you made a mess of it before you came to Christ. Amen? So, why not give him the rest of it? All right. If you have your Bibles now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll begin in verse 20 as an introduction to something I'm going to preach about. I'm going to preach about one word, now, N-O-W. It's one word, and there's a lot to be said about it. Uh, I wish I could have implemented it in my life, uh, especially my early Christian life. I wish I could have implemented that word, and it would uh, save me a lot of uh, unnecessary trouble. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, I do thank you for what you've done with uh, Brother Kim and the church here. I thank you for what you've done with me. It was a tough road for you. I realize that. And, uh, but I thank you for the ana final analysis. You have gotten me where you want me to be, and I thank you for that. I pray that you're blessed uh, preaching tonight and anoint the preacher, give him the things to say that are expedient for those that hear it, and we'll thank you for that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, now, uh, beginning in verse 20 in chapter 5, it says, Now are we ambassadors. 
There's a peculiar thing about that word ambassador if you study it out. An ambassador is not an elected position, it's, a, uh, it's an appointed position. And it says uh, uh, an ambassador is uh, an, app uh, an appointed position and uh, what an ambassador does is he, he makes friends uh, with enemies. He tries to bring them together in order for them to reconcile the differences that they have. And uh, I don't know, some, you know sometimes God's people think that if they're not uh, a pastor, a missionary, or an evangelist, or some kind of uh, special position, which is not a special position, it's just the position in which God has selected for them to serve God. Each and, every, each and every one of us are all called to be an ambassador and to, be a rec, uh, to reconcile the differences between men and God. And that's what you do. You're called to do that. Everybody's called to do that to begin with. And the other one, stuff is just appointed certain positions to do certain things to glorify the name of Jesus Christ and to exalt and bring to a conclusion the body of Christ. Uh, he represents, an ambassador represents uh, the mind of the person that sent him. Uh, for instance, if um, Sleepy, Sleepy what's his name? Joe. Sleepy what? Joe. Joe. Joe, yeah, Sleepy Joe. <laughs> Go goes to show you how much attention I pay to <laughs> politics. If, if Sleep, Sleepy Joe were to send somebody to China, that individual would have to represent Sleepy Joe. He could have no opinions of his own, which would be a mistake on his part. <laughs> but anyway, that's the truth of an ambassador. That's the truth of what you and I need to do. Uh, when, whereas uh, someone that is trying to reconcile uh, the difference between Jesus Christ and the individual, we're not inclined, well, we are inclined, but we should never interject our opinions. Yeah. What we need to do is to represent the mind of the individual that sent us to do what he's called us to do. Uh, so you need to remember that much, amen? Uh, opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one, they're all different. And the truth of the matter is you are called to do that as an individual. As a child of God, that's the position you have. That's first and foremost, whether you become uh, 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 a cleaner in the church or you become a pastor, an evangelist, or a minister, or a missionary, or whatever, that's secondary. Yeah. The first and foremost thing is to recognize in your mind that you are doing what you're doing in order to reconcile sinners to Jesus Christ. Amen. For he said, uh, continue in verse 5, uh, now are we ambassadors for Christ as though we did beseech you uh, by us. In other words, uh, what is actually being said here is that you're talking, you're speaking in behalf of Jesus Christ. It's as if Christ was right there, so you have to be careful what you're saying to make sure that you're... You, Philippians said an easy way to accomplish that particular end is the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, he's talking about his humanity. He didn't think it was a robbery to be equal with God, which is, can be translated to you. The truth of the matter is, You're to reconcile to God. You're to reconcile sinners to Jesus Christ. He said he hath made him to be sin for us. Uh, jump now into chapter 6 and verse 1. We then as workers together with him. We are co-laborers with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You can't, uh, you can't exempt the Holy Spirit in this matter because we're going to be talking about him a lot in the text. Uh, because the Lord Jesus Christ came, he said, I've come to do and finish the work of God, my Father. God started the work with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He came to finish it as God promised that he would come, but he was rejected. The Bible said he came into his own, and his own received him not. And as a result, you got 
grafted in, the Bible says. But uh, it says, uh, we beseech you on behalf of Christ. And he said, I, I have heard thee in a time accepted. Um, just about any time is accepted with God if you want to get right with God. He says, I've heard you in a time accepted, and the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now yeah. is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I'd like to preach to you for a little while. We're not going to pray again on the subject of now. Now is, uh, as an adjective, I think that's it, an adjective is defined as something that's immediate. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, okay? So the ministry now in this dispensation is the Holy Spirit of God. You have to somehow, through uh, prayer, church attendance, uh, doing the things necessary to keep your spirit regenerated so that when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, you can respond now. Yeah. Don't wait. Tomorrow might be too late. As a matter of fact, uh, not responding now might be some kind of Im immediate danger. Uh, for instance, if uh, your if a house was on fire and you were in it, and I say, "Hey, get out of this house! It's on fire!" You wouldn't hesitate to meditate on the thing. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, you wouldn't stop to meditate on it. Well, that's how God is. We always want to meditate on it and pray about it and think about it. But you know what? What it happens is that it becomes a conviction, and conviction becomes a, command, a companion after a while. Once, a, once that, listen, God's going to deal with you so long about the things he's been dealing with you. And look, I know, if you're anything like me, he's been dealing with you about some things for a long time. You know the problem with that is, somewhere down the line, he might stop talking to you about it. There's no room for debate when God speaks to you. You act immediately. There are some principles applied to the, to the Holy Ghost that must be uh, acted upon immediately. He speaks. We need to answer. We need to do. Uh, a philosopher once said, ours is not to something but ours to do. <laughs> Don't think about it. Just do it. <laughs> There's no room for debate. There's, uh, there are some things that are held in high esteem in our personal lives as a Christian that we should not put aside till later on, such as honesty and decency and obligation and faithfulness uh, for the sake of uh, maybe profit or pleasure, expediency, or put aside and defile a good conscience. Don't do that. Don't do that. Things of great value should never be... Uh, should, uh, should be upheld at all times. And uh, what should be upheld in all times is the preeminence of God in the forefront of your minds. You keep God and the Lord Jesus Christ in the forefront of your mind, giving him preeminence in all things, you won't have much trouble with sin. Listen, don't sell out, Christian. Don't sell out Christian character for expediency. It's, it's a shame to the position of being in Christ and him in you. Look at, uh, look at verse 4 and verse 6. It says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience and affliction and necessities and distress. He's Paul's, you know who he's talking about? He's talking about himself. He's given himself as an example. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fasting, by pureness. Listen, anybody can uh, live for Christ, not, maybe not anybody, but it's a lot easier to live for Christ when you got all your ducks in a row and you got a good job and things are going good, but it'll prove your mettle if you're able to live for Christ when things aren't going good. You don't sell out Christian character, it's an affront. To the grace of God. It's, uh, it's receiving the grace of God in vain. They say the proof is in the pudding. How you act out on the, on the, how you act out on the fire will prove whether or not you're a good soldier or not. Amen. 
The Bible says for us to be good soldiers. It says that because you're in a warfare. Now, uh, we know the verse in Ephesians, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and all in high places. I take that not only to be in high places. I'm not worried about the principalities that are in heaven. I'm worried about the ones that are in Smokey Joe or whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't wrestle with him. I wrestle with what is in him, see? That's the principalities and powers I'm worried about, the ones that make legislations. Listen, tomorrow is always a good day to do what you should have done today. <laughs> you know... Drug addicts and alcohol, alcoholics always quit tomorrow. Yeah. It's always that this is the last drink I'm going to have. And the reason why he says that, because he's loaded to the gills, he couldn't drink another one anyway if he wanted to. Yeah. Drug addicts are like that. I mean, I have vast knowledge of uh, drugs. I mean, experienced knowledge. I can give you the chemical compositions of them and what they do physically and what each individual drug does and what marijuana does, heroin, morphine, dialogue, patapoin, what they all do, how they get there and what they do to you. And they are indeed spirits to some degree. Tomorrow becomes the day that becomes tomorrow, but never now. The uh, uncommitted Christian is like that. They'll read their Bible later. They'll read it first thing tomorrow, but never now. Right. Never now. They never get started. And then when they get started, they run across a little bit in, uh, in uh, Second Chronicles or Numbers. <laughs> and then you, you just give up. You know, uh, I, I, I don't understand half of it, to tell you the truth. I, I can't hardly pronounce most of the name. But you know what? It's the Word of God. So I make myself read it, even if I don't understand it. You know what God uh, you know what God will do for you? He'll give you greater understanding on the things that you do know. Amen. Amen. It'll, it'll uh, increase your, uh, your addiction, too, I'll tell you that, when you get to Chronicles, when you start me memorizing those names. Listen, there's something about now. There's something about now that you need to know. Uh, the value of now is in the fact that once it's set aside, it can never be retrieved. You're never going to get it again. As a matter of fact, what's so desperate about it is that when you get some information from God, the Holy Spirit, and you don't act on it, the trouble is, the, the most trouble that could, ha could occur in that is that he never mentions it to you again. You know what? We get the idea that God is always in a position of telling us something that's going to do us some harm. I mean, anything that God asks you to do is in your best interest. Amen. I don't care what it is. It's in your best interest Amen. that you pay attention to God. Listen, you know what? He doesn't really need you. He can raise up stones to glorify him. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to get any hotter, but I felt like I was a little warm there. <laughs> Turn it up, David said this in Psalm 63. He said, Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Yeah. Well, you know what that means? Early. Don't wait when you're in trouble. Yeah. Seek him early in trouble, Amen. early in testing, yeah. early in temptation. Oh. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God does, you know why God likes doing things for you? Because when he does things for you, it glorifies him, and it builds a, a relationship. You want a relationship with God? Obey God. He's got the big stick. The man with the big stick sets the standard. David said, earlier will I seek thee. There are th three occasions, I'll give you a personal testimony. <clears throat> there are three occasions that happened to me in my life that had I not sought, sought the Lord early, 
in, in these temptations, I would not be here today. The situation was so overwhelming, the devil had pressed my button, boy. He knew exactly how he could get to me, and he did. And I was fighting it the best that I could do, and I come to a point where it looked like I was going to be defeated and, uh, defeated, and God spoke to me as clear as, as the day, as clear as I'm speaking today to you. God said to me, if you do that, boy, I'm finished with you in the ministry. And uh, I mean, it was clear, too. I mean, it was clear, brother. And I said, in desperation, I said, if that's true, oh, God, help me because I need you now. Amen. Call upon the name of the Lord, Amen. and he will deliver thee. I didn't say, well, let me think about it. <laughs> I was happy he came to my rescue. Yes. I tell you something about the people that say things like I'm saying right now, and I hope I never have the occasion to be, to be sorry that I'm saying such things. But if David had took his own advice and called upon Lord, the Lord in his temptation with Bathsheba, he'd have never had trouble in his life, in that, in, at least in that, in that area. Yielding to the Holy Spirit is in the moment of time is what secures our walk with Christ. Moment by moment. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Uh, illustrating that there is condemnation. If you don't. It's not eternal condemnation, but it's condemnation nevertheless. You know what it is? It's trouble. That's what the condemnation he's talking about. He's talking about not having the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. He's talking about not having a happy marriage. He's talking about not coming to church and getting the value of the preaching. That's what he's talking about. Yielding to the Holy Spirit in the moment of time. In the moment of time, moment by moment. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I fly from above. Looking to Jesus, the glory does shine. Moment by moment, oh Lord, I am thine. In a moment, not later on, right now, he's mine. Right now is time for you to get things right with God. I've heard say that uh, uh, you know one other thing about what I was just preaching about the moments of time and how you use them for the glory of Christ you know what happens those moments by moment they culminate in what you are at this very minute the sequence of events in your life that you either obeyed or didn't obey, obey and you are the results of it today. Amen. If you're not satisfied with where you are, get busy. Amen. Get busy in obeying God when he talks to you. Amen. I've never been satisfied with my Christianity. Paul has not either. He said, I, I press towards them all for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I've heard that in, in a time accepted. You know, it'll determine, it'll determine some things in your life. It'll determine uh, how you finish your race, depending upon right. moment by moment in your life. Yeah. Uh, I brought this up last Sunday at Brother Master's church. Uh, there's a, in Romans 12, at the end of Romans 12, the, uh, there's a, a verse that says, the women... Uh, refusing deliverance that they might have a better resurrection. You know, what the you know what the situation there was? Refusing deliverance that Rome was in, in power and they were put on, the, uh, put on the block, so to speak, as to whether or not they were going to deny Christ or get whatever they intended to do maybe cut their heads off or kill their children. And it says that the women refused deliverance. Yeah. 
that they might have a better resurrection. A better resurrection. You know what that means? Every resurrection is not going to be the same. You know why? It's going to come up at the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, I'm telling you folks, you need to take everything that you do in light of the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, all of us have shortcomings. All of us, uh, sometime or another, resist the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But at that moment, you need to say, oh, God, I'm sorry, and put it under the blood. Because if you don't, you'll forget about it, and it's going to come up. It's going to come up. It's got to come up if it isn't put under the blood. I've heard that at a time accepted, any time is accepted with God, any time is accepted as an accepted time with the Lord to dispense the grace needed to the challenge of your faith. That's what temptation is, you know. Temptation is a challenge to your faith. Temptation says, you can do this. It isn't that bad. And God says, I can give you something better than that. It's all a question of faith. Bob Jones Sr. said that uh, all sin could be traced back to a lack of faith. And I was thinking about the things that can come up in my life or any life, and I can't find one thing that, would, uh, that couldn't be defeated by faith in the promises of God. The trouble of this life is uh, any time is accepted with God. The Bible says in Psalm 51, I quoted it earlier, call upon me in a day of trouble. Silence, they say, is, um, is, uh, is uh, uh, silence is what? Silence is glorious or whatever? Golden. What is it? Golden. Yeah, golden. Uh, I, I ain't so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever said that wasn't put in a position where he needed to open his mouth for Jesus Christ. I tell you that. You know one of the troubles with uh, with with Baptists, they have it uh, among other things. <laughs> one of the things they they all they're always. They're always wanting to blame everything on the flesh, yeah. you know. But I'm going to tell you something uh, profound now. I mean, we're, now we're talking about what we heard. Hell, were you here for the Bible study last night? Let me see your hand. Wasn't that great? That was some great study. All right. So, you know what I, I found in my study about the body, soul, and spirit? And that the flesh, which is see, hear, smell, taste, touch, that the flesh needs permission in order to do what it does. You know where it gets permission from? It gets permission from you. That's where it gets permission from. Listen, there's no good thing in it, amen? So if it could act independent without permission, you'd never do anything right. You want to think about that. So quit blaming it on the flesh. Listen, as long as you take the flesh and keep it within the perimeter of God's allowances, there's nothing wrong with it. I tell you what, try to run a hundred yard dash without the flesh. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> That's it, folks. You know, the fact of the matter is that you're going to obey one of two spirits. Yeah. Now, it might be called the devil or demons or the uh, divination. or uh, You're going to follow one of two spirits. And you are going to make the decision. It won't be God. God makes no decisions for you. Lamentation 336 says to subvert a man in his cause, God Approveth not. I stood up in church one day in Bible Baptist and I raised my hand and I quoted that verse to Dr. Ruckman. I said, Would you say that that is a good verse on free will? And he said, Yes. 
You make the decision, pal. You make the decision which one you're going to follow. Romans 6.16. 6, know ye not that to whom you yield yourself, to him ye are servant, whom you yield yourself, either obedience unto righteousness uh, or righteousness unto holiness. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God still speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The only trouble is, is not to be included in the canon of the scriptures. You mean to tell me you don't believe that a man can be holy in speaking the truth of God? Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If I didn't think I was moved by the Holy Ghost to come in here and tell you what I'm telling you, I'd just take a stinking seat and sit down. <laughs> Holy men of God still speak as they were uh, moved by the Holy Ghost. Doesn't mean he's holy all the time. <laughs> but if he prayed up and confessed up and gets behind his pulpit and he's got a King James Bible, he ought to be able to hold it. Listen at this. Boy, that's a beautiful verse. This is something, I mean, this is something, I mean, absolutely beautiful. It's so, uh, so personal. Uh, I, I think it was uh, David that said it. I don't, I don't have my, King, uh, my uh, Dr. Ruckman's Bible here. I got this other Bible I, I was using for years until when Doc came out with his Bible and I threw everything else away. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I kept this one because I had so many messages written in it. Uh, where was I? I hate to say those kind of things. It just throws my mind just way off. I don't know. That don't know where I'm at. Yeah, uh, right. You'll serve one or two spirits. Sin will keep. Uh, that sin will not have dominion over you. Uh, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common. Today is the day to call on the Lord to accomplish in your life what you think you need to have accomplished. I mean, there's some things in your life that you want done, amen? amen. There's some things that, you, uh, that isn't finalized in your life. And I don't know what you need to get it done. I don't know the deficiencies in your personal character. Maybe I don't know what it is. I know the shortcomings of myself and I'm always asking God to help me in those matters that I might get through them uh, I think God doesn't take them away completely and I'm glad that he doesn't it, it affords me the opportunity to always call upon him in things that I need and I'm a needy person I don't know about you but I'm a needy person I need God without God I wouldn't last I wouldn't last two minutes as a Christian David says this, I think it was David he, in Psalm 30. He, it's very, very personal. He says, uh, thou hast turned for me. Oh, boy. Wow. Not for you, not for Israel, not for anybody else. He says, thou hast turned for me. Oh, My morning into dancing. Yeah. And thou hast put off my sackcloth and girdeth me with gladness, and here's the reason behind it. To the, to the end, he has turned for me my morning into dancing, thou hast put off my sackcloth, and girdeth me with gladness to the end, the purpose, that my glory may sing praises unto thee and not be silent. Amen. You know what? That's what I was asking about silent, silent, silence is, uh, is golden. No, it's not. I think silence is one of the major causes why people today are not getting the message they need to have in order for them to get out of the mess they're in. Not considering death, eternal death. God's people are silent. Yeah. They don't speak up. Yeah. They're waiting to get everything here. Listen, you are an ambassador. Yes. You are a reconciler. You are given the ministry of reconciliation. There may be something in your friend's life 
that you know that they can't see. And because you keep silent, they're never going to change it. They want to know that somebody, they know God. Maybe God spoke to them. Maybe they can't hear it, but they can hear from you. They can put, you, you can put a hand around their, sh their shoulder and give them the ministry that God has given to you. You know, I thought about that when David said that, my glory. You know what I think? Uh, I can think of nothing more glorious than the fact that I am one with God through Jesus Christ. I'm one. I'm in him. He's in me. I can't think nothing more glorious than that. And as the psalmist says, to the end that my glory should be not be silent. Silence may be the major cause for the death of this world remaining in that condition. Yeah. Listen, friend. People you meet, you ain't got to, you don't have to preach a three-point outline with an invitation. Every time you meet somebody, listen. They can tell whether God's in you by your countenance. Yeah. Christians walk around like they're lost. Man, you ought to be happy you saved. I mean, listen, you ought to be the only happy people in the world. I'm happy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now is the day. Today, not tomorrow, to proclaim the glory of being in Christ that shows forth your peculiarity. You know, being peculiar... Uh, I'm sure your pastor defined it, it bears repeating, though. Uh, it's like uh, peculiarity. Something being peculiar is akin to the object. For instance, uh, we say that uh, uh, ammonia has a peculiar smell. You know? Or a rose has a peculiar odor to it, or smell to it. It doesn't mean it stinks. It just means it's, uh, it's peculiar to that individual thing you know what's peculiar about you you pray you praise God you come to church you witness for Jesus Christ you're able to go through troubles like nobody else that's a peculiar thing in life today Amen. now is the day of proclaiming the glory of being Christ that shows forth peculiarity now is the time to get busy for God. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation, either for eternal life or the salvation of saving you from self and sin. Now, today, not tomorrow. Today's the day. That's something in your life you need to get right with God. Now is the time for you to come and renew the commitment to service. You know what's important about an altar call? That the individual has to stand up as a soldier. And say, Lord, here I am. Help me. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Every head bowed and every eye closed. While you're praying, I'm going to tell you a few things. The important thing about an altar call is to stand up and come forward. We've got some ladies coming forward now. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his fall. Live highest banner. His banner. You ain't, you ain't got to carry a sign. You can lift the banner just in your countenance. Lift high. I'm resolved. I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Now is the time to proclaim a noble cause. I found the cause uh, to uh, I found a cause to uh, a flag to follow, a cause for which to stand. A cause for which to stand. Now, now is the time to do those things. Now is the time to call upon God. Now is the time to seek his face. Now is the time to get the power to do the things that you want to do for God. You have ambitions for God. Now is the time to call upon God and give you, the, give you what you need. You got ambitions for God? You can get it done if you call upon him. 
If you don't have any ambition, ambitions for God, you ought to ask God for one. Yeah, that's good. You ought to have something you don't like that uh, separates you from the average Christian. Then I don't want to be a nominal Christian. I don't want to be just like anybody else. I want something special, Lord. I want to do something special for you. Every Christian wants to do that. Not now, but later. Why? That your heart might be filled to overflowing and not be silent any longer. Uh, the altar call is open. Please feel free to come if the Lord led it upon your heart. I mean, altar call is open now. Now. You know what the mistake is for some of you who the Holy Spirit's calling? There's an altar call later. I have plenty of altar calls later now. Now, you know, if uh, you're used to living in the flesh and the Lord said, get right with that now, you know this from previous experience. When you said, I'll do it later, at the moment you said, I'll do it later at the now moment, that means the next time is also the same response. Later. No better time than now. No better time than now if the Holy Spirit's calling your heart. I'm not pressuring you. I don't believe in forcing altars, but some of you, you know the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, and you should come. He's dealing with you with something. Now's the perfect time. Now's the perfect time. Maybe he could give you something on the next one, too, if you ask him for help now. Now, now is the accepted time. Now is the accepted time. Will you come? Will you come? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We often get very hurt and grieved why the loved ones we're dealing with, they won't respond now. Maybe it's because your testimony is similar. You don't respond now either. How long did it take for you to get saved? How long did it take for you to get right with God? Isn't it fair in return that your loved one will do it as long as you? Maybe by that time it'll be too late and they go to hell. Maybe by that time it'll be too late and they can never, never live their lives for God. A lot of you don't realize how incredibly lucky, but that's not the right word. How incredibly blessed, blessed you are. Where God puts you where you're at. If they see your now, I wonder if they might see the urgency of it, and they might do something now too. Lord dealt with you. Let him speak to you now. Let him speak to you now. Amen. Such good preaching. There's still time. There's a song that goes, I've wandered far away from God. Now, now, now I'm coming home, paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Oh, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Father, as I come before you in prayer, thank you for this very start of the message where we could respond now. This message did not have to be the last message, Father. Perhaps you have so much more in store. And that's why you want us to get right now. That way we can have the same reaction on the next sermons that we might be resistant to. Father, will you uh, reach out anybody who needs help, who needs who needs your grace, who is hurting. They're, they need to hear from you. Or those who are just 
resistant. They're apathetic. Be merciful to your children here, Father, as you've done for their salvation, Lord. Will you do so with their walk, Lord? We still have other sermons to go. Will the Holy Spirit move and speak to them? This is not a competition. This is not to put uh, a preachers on higher levels where they're supposed to preach something spectacular. It's only complete yielding to your Holy Spirit. And we've seen that at the beginning here. Help us to see you speaking to us, Father. Help us not to look at the coil of flesh, but to look inside and see what you're trying to tell us, Father. Maybe even one word of the entire message you're speaking to us. Please help us to take something with us that can last us permanently in life and we can live better days for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I would like our instruments to come forward again. Um, we, because of time's sake, um, we're going to uh, head off to the next song now. If you have to use the restroom, please feel free to use the restroom over there. If you can hold for one more service, then we sure appreciate if you can do that. Uh, we like to keep the spirit, and also I'd like to respect your time. But please feel free if you need to use the restrooms, they're in the back there, all right? Just all you have to do is walk in the back, and then uh, make sure you look at the sign label, okay? I'm sure you're used to that, all right? <laughs> Don't, so we're not like other places here, how they use restrooms, okay? If, <laughs> so. Okay, then. All right, then. So if I can have the instruments here, all right? We are going to... Take out our burgundy hymnal, please. Take out our burgundy hymnals. It's the uh, or it's the brown. Some people are debating here, burgundy or brown hymnal in here. <laughs> so okay then, if you'll take out the big brown hymn book or the burgundy one, however uh, you want to see it as, page 66 in the big brown, please. 66, <laughs> 66 in the big brown hymn book. Okay. Holy, holy, holy. Can I have the intro? Here we go. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity.
Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We're going to sing Satisfied, Satisfied. And then it'll be in our brown hymnals, 417. 417, please. 417. Uh, whenever uh, you're ready, just give me the intro. All my life long I had panted for a drop from some clear spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. seated. Praise the Lord. Man, as one, as one preacher would say, are you satisfied? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. I would like to ask Pastor Anthony Rudolph to continue the spirit for us. Amen. Lord, fill you, sir. Amen. All right. See what the Lord is laying upon your heart. All right. God bless you, sir. Thank you for coming again. Uh, no your water's right there. Bruh. Hey! Come on, Richard. Brother, you're gonna think you're gonna make them think we all racist or something. <laughs> You know, you know they already on the news talking about we can't be racist. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just messing with him. He's talking about his, I'm his favorite preacher. And I, I, I don't know how that happened, but praise, <laughs> praise the Lord. Listen, praise the Lord. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18. Uh, one of my favorite people in the Bible is the Apostle Paul, and we just so happen to be at our church teaching through the book of Acts, and because it's a transitional book, and you've got to have people understand. Uh, people come to church, and you, when you plant a church and you're dealing with people that never read their Bibles before, they don't, they don't know what this stuff is. Uh, uh, we said it last night, folk are going to struggle with two natures. 
If you're going to lead somebody to the Lord, they're going to struggle with two natures, and they're going to struggle with eternal security, and they're going to struggle with baptism, because most folk are teaching folk that you got to get baptized. Some, they're teaching some other baptism than, the, than the following the Lord Jesus Christ and believers' baptism. Amen. They're teaching something else, yeah. or they're adding something to it. Yeah. They're teaching something else, so I, that's what we're doing in our, book, in our church, and uh, it just gets so much out of the book of Acts when you just slow down and read it. Just slow down and read it. it uh, you, we, uh, Paul is the greatest Christian that ever lived. Uh, you can say who you wanted to believe it is, but it's Paul. You ain't been through what Paul been through. And, you know, God made an open show on Paul in front of everybody. He do that for you? I know you say, I'm serving with my little part of the country. I'm struck. No, it ain't well, Paul. Right now, we catch Paul on the second missionary journey. And they, listen, you, Paul is a Jew of Jews. And guess who we have problems with? Jews. Jews. We was talking about this morning how, uh, uh, brother, that, that service just last night was tremendous. But uh, I always say, you know why Satan hates you? Because God gave you his job. Yes. Yes. Now, Rick, think about this. Yeah. He was perfect in beauty, perfect in everything. Yes. You ain't been perfect <laughs> in nothing. In perfect in nothing. They've been selling you so many products to tell you that's going to make you better and all of this and... You ain't been perfect ever. You ain't, even when, listen, I, you know, I say it all the time. You know the people that take the pictures in their car, they sitting up there taking different pictures. They, they flicking their hair this way and they turning this way. And they got to fix their clothes or whatever way they got to fix it. I say it all the time. They take 99 pictures and post two or three. They rejected over 90 of their own pictures that they took themselves of their, mo of their own self. And did get mad when you rejected the three that they picked. It's just vainness, it's just foolishness. We ain't never been perfect, but Satan was. And when he, when he loses his position, God give it to us, and he know he looking at us. <laughs> you can give my job to, you know. You, you ever been at work and you know what I'm saying? You're supposed to be the next person up for the position. You're the best candidate for the position. And they give it to somebody that you think is less than. <laughs> How do you feel then? Yeah. Think about how Satan feels. And then God goes and, like you say, gives us a soul. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he wants to be God. He wants yeah. to get God's glory. He wants, to, he wants all the worship for him. Yeah. You know, that perfection, that beauty, that, all that. You know, that beautiful singing voice, the beautiful yeah. body that makes all the best music in the world. Yeah. That was made just for worship. And then he says, I'm, it's going to be y'all job to worship next. You're going to be in charge of worshiping me. And you, and you, you, you born with a spirit that's dead. That spirit has to be, I talked about it last night. The, the difference is that spirit is quickened. When you're saved, you have a quickened spirit. If the spirit comes from God, so it don't matter if you did anything, if the spirit got quickened or not, it still has to go back to God. You, you doing any, what you do in the process has nothing to do with it. God did it. It's like a child. God gave you something. You need to take good care of it. Amen. You're a steward of it. Yes. Now, some of us, God did some ringing and wrenching of us for us to say, okay, God, I, I need to be saved. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And we got saved. I, you, I heard a guy says, well, I just don't think that if they, don't, they get saved because they don't want to go to hell, that ain't good enough. I said, you a fool. <laughs> you know, I really ain't interested in the reason you got saved as long as you got saved. Amen. 
Now, I'm not staying back there. Now, it's time to get to growing in grace and knowledge and wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something more perfect way. That's all right. The Bible in Acts chapter 18, the Bible says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Listen, God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the children of Israel departed Egypt. All right. It wasn't a bad thing. Depart people always think departing is a, a bad thing. Sometimes some people in your family have departed this earth because it was time for them to go. So I hear, heard somebody tell me the other day, I'm still upset because my mom is dead. I say, she dead. <laughs> no, no, listen, listen, it, I'm sick of this ancestor worship. My ancestors. I'm sick of it. Listen, after some, listen, God takes people out of your life for good reasoning. Now, if you're young, I say it all the time. If you're young and you die at 20, 25, 30, the good don't die young. So all it is, shirts, bring them back, all of, all of that. They pictures on your shirt, burn. See, all of this foolishness, you get, the, you get your eyes off of God looking at everybody else. Listen, there's a lot of departing going on. Listen, you, if you're saved today, you should have departed from that sinful lifestyle that you used to be in. Now, when Paul departs someplace, and you, we know that this is the second missionary journey. He goes three times. He keep going back, checking on these people. He keep going back to help. But he departs. He goes to Corinth. The Bible says he came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Achilla, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy and with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. When you're following the Lord, God's going to send help. He's going to find you're going to find companionship. And guess what they had in common? They both, they both were persecuted. By the government. The government. I know you think we got good godly government in America. Guess what? Most 90% of them probably ain't saved. And if they are saved, they ain't read a Bible, picked it up. They don't have good, clean. They don't have sound doctrine. They couldn't worship God in truth and spirit if it counted on their lives. <laughs> they, they can't, bro. Somebody, listen, unless some... Uh, uh, Paul, it, I can't remember. He says, I, it, they, okay, Acts chapter 8. He said, I needed a man to guide me. Yeah. 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 Men only do what they've been taught. So while you trying to tell somebody why they're so messed up and all of that, somebody taught them that didn't know the truth. So guess what? God might have just put you in their path Amen. To, to a more perfect way. Wow. Aquila and Priscilla. The Bible says, and because he was the same craft, and God always sends somebody with companionship so that you have something in common with. He abode with them and wrought for their occupation. They were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. You know what Paul did every time he went to a city? He went into the synagogue. Every, when he go into the city, he's going to the place of worship. He's a Jew, a Jew. He, listen, he, he was the star pupil of Gamaliel. Yeah. Yeah. It's him. He's the, he's the teacher's pet. Yeah. That's, That's who he was. Yeah. And when he, listen, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Yeah. He knew that they were not worshiping God in truth and in spirit. He knew that they were worshiping, trying to worship God ignorantly, and he just wanted to show them a more better way. I, I have better understanding. I have, I've been given the dispensation of grace. And so he's going into the, he said, hey, God, moving away from that. That ain't what it is, man. This is where we at. You're lost. You're back there. And that was messed up. Uh, let me help you. The Bible says that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Amen. If you are a Christian today, you should at some point in your life be pressed. Now, listen, the Bible says when his help came, he already had some help. He had Priscilla and Achilla, Achilla and Priscilla, and then... Timotheus and uh, Silas come 
more help. He says, hey, we're going to have to turn the heat up a little bit in here. Amen. And he told them Jesus was Christ. Amen. The Bible says, and when they oppose themselves, listen, folk that don't know the truth, they oppose themselves. They are just there. They don't, I say it all the time. When you know you're out street preaching and they're taking pictures of you and, and, and taking and video of you, you know they bear witness against themselves, right? Are they going to watch that thing? Are they going to watch it? They're going to send it to their friend? They're going to send it? You and smile when they start taking it. Preach louder when they start taking the video. Give them the verses when they start preaching the video. They start taking the video, give it to them. They just opposing themselves because they don't know no better. And God puts you in their life to give them more clear understanding of it. The Bible says he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. You heard what he said, right? Is that what he did? That ain't what he did. You know, you say a lot of stuff that may be biblical. You know, I love saying this to Bible believers. We love preaching all of this Bible. We love preaching it. But all good preaching ain't practical. You can't take it and implement it in somebody's life and help them grow in grace and knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ. Listen, there's a lot of Bible that I know, but some of it can't help somebody as a single mom that's struggling with her kids then got her kids back try she look at my wife and says i want my kids to be just like i want to be like brother rudolph's wife and i want to raise my kids the same way she has no my wife is was raised in it she was born in it mm -hmm. in, in a black community you, you know how some folk think that only we got the truth no you don't God, on the, God in the suburbs, is God in the ghetto, God in the hood, God in the projects. He, he still, he's, look, he's walking to and fro in the earth looking for a man. And the question is, is will the man, when God says, it's you, say, here are my Lord sending me. Because, you know, we just don't, you know, God, I, I, I'm, you, this new thing, I'm chasing my purpose. <laughs> If your purpose is not from above, but is earthly, devilish, and sensual, if you didn't get your purpose from the Bible, from God, with, uh, you know, extra, you know, from, uh, with, with uh, uh, confirmation from the pulpit, confirmation from your prayer closet, confirmation from other Christians, confirmation from preaching, Take your purpose <laughs> and throw it in hell, okay? <laughs> Put it on Facebook and tag me in it. Put it on Facebook and tag me in it. I don't got no problem. If they want to fight, we can do it all day. care nothing about your purpose. Your purpose means nothing if it ain't from God. The Bible says, he says, he says your bloods be upon your heads, but listen, he, that ain't what he meant, because this is his people. And guess what he going to do? He going to go to them again. He going to go to them dead. He goes to his people to his own destruction. It might be said that Paul might have died early, because he didn't go to the Gentiles. God is a, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. He just so happened to be a Jew. And he just gave God, God allows you to have stuff that you're going to struggle with. Yeah. You know, we always look at Christians, oh, he's got everything. They got their eyes dot, their T's crossed. He got the <laughs> Baptist park, the Baptist glasses and all of that. <laughs> Ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Yeah. They're struggling just like you're struggling. <laughs> and the only person holding them together, like what's holding you together, is the, the blood of Jesus Christ and the spirit of God. And that's why you got to read your Bible, because you will find out that the men in the Bible are just like you. 
you will see, you'll get to, you get in your Bible, start reading your Bible, like, oh, I got that problem. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped, worshipped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. You know, when he said that, he's upset. He's, he's frustrated. Because you know what he wants to do? He wants to do like Jonah did. See, Jonah didn't appreciate the opportunity that he had when he goes into Nineveh. You, you, and I say it all the time. Think about it. Jonah jumps out the water. He pop out the wall, right? And whatever this, whatever's in the, the whale's belly then turned him whatever. It's prob probably Snow White and Leprous. And some, ten, some dude went over there with his nets. He heard the story because every time everybody parked, once that boat got to shore, they told like, man, look, I'm telling you what happened, man. Jonah was on our boat and we told him, he, we made him walk the plank and when he was walking the plank, the, the the water cleared, the, the sky cleared, and Jaws came out and got it. And they went back to shore and told everybody. And you know everybody was like, yeah, whatever, man, y'all talking crazy or whatever. And the dude over there fixing this net and the whale pop up on, it, on the beach and Jonah pop out and he, he looking like... <laughs> And he wasn't cleaning his net no more. He, wow. He said, man, I'm telling you, I just seen Jonah, man. The dude is looking. I'm telling you, he came straight out the well. This got to be it. It's got to. It's the Anthony Rudolph verse. Listen, it's the Anthony Rudolph version. It's got, it's got a little Detroit in it, a little Ebonics in it, and everything. Jonah gets to Nineveh, the whole, I mean, everybody repents, everybody. The animals, everybody is repenting. How's that for not having a soul? The animals had enough sense that that's Jonah. Think about it. Now just think about it. Listen, the animals like Jonah, that's Jonah. I don't know what kind of language the animals I don't know what kind of language the, the whale did, what he had to get all the animals to understand. Jonah is on the way. But everybody repents. Everybody. You know what Paul thinking? I'm going to have a revival just like Jonah. And when he goes into a town, every time his own people go against him, the, he, the Gentiles, a lot of Gentiles getting saved, and he's like, how is they getting it and y'all not getting it? The oracles of God were given to our people. Yeah. And I'm giving you Bible. It should be clear to you. You know, you, you ever seen somebody, you're trying to give them a clear presentation of the gospel? You think you done went all the way up, down through there, and they looking at you with, they just lost. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> he leaves. He's frustrated. And God always, when you did what he told you to do and there's some frustration, he just gives you a, some, a little glimmer, a little, a little uh, 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 stuff on purpose, Jews, some little Jews right there on purpose. And the Bible says, and he departed thence and entered to a certain man's house named Justice, one that works for God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. He's right there at the synagogue. The synagogue, they're not worshiping God in truth and the spirit, the Bible says, but he worshiped God. The Bible says, and not only that, it said, and Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. So now he gives them a little fruit, just one little thing out there, and he gives you some extra encouragement. But guess what? Paul, Paul still, he, you know how when God blesses you after it's been a downtime? And you know you miss some of that sometimes. And it take you two, three years, four years to get back. Like, wait a minute, God, as soon as that happened, I was down and God blessed me and I was still stressing it. He blessed me a little more and it, the light just came on a little bit, but I missed it and all of that. The Bible says, and then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision in the darkest time. Because he's thinking that, hey, hey, God, we should, something should have happened. God speaks to him, be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Hey, keep, keep preaching. 
It don't matter if you don't get the results. Yeah, we want, everybody wants 1,000, 10,000, 20,000. What we saying that. It sounds good, but you don't want to deal with those, that many people. You don't want that many people know your number. You, you don't want that many people. He said, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I, for I am with thee. When God's presence, you know what you want? Listen, I, you always want God's presence with you. you want, he says, I am with you. Listen, you can't lose when God's with you. Amen. You can lose when it's just, if me and my wife fought against the world, we'd lose. Yeah. And listen, it, it ain't because of my wife, but I think I can fight, but we can't take everybody off. Yeah. But with God with us, and we're doing it God's way, Amen. we can't lose. He says, not only he says, for I am with thee, and no man shall set thee set to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Okay. Now, I always explain much people like this. There's much people to get saved. All right? There's much people. The job is to turn up San Jose and all, San Francisco, Oakland, and all this area up, tied upside down on his head with the gospel. There's much people that need to get saved. But there's much people that need to repent and come back to God's house and get back right with God and get encouraged. There's get back in church and there's much people to be encouraged. There's much people to be encouraged. There's somebody sitting around watching you at your job on your listen on your job. They're watching you. When you're in the store, they're watching you. Your neighbors were watching you. And this is one of those things I say, you should be so faithful. They should know, your neighbors should know what time you go to church. They should know what time you go to church and what time you're going to get back from church. They should be coming to your house, sit down, watch TV, make them a sandwich and watch TV and say, oh, they'll be back in about a few more minutes. We got this much time. It's people watching you. On your job, at the, at the, at the, uh, every time you come in the supermarket, they're watching you. They're watching how you act, how you talk, how you dress. I know you say, well, I, we just dress like that at church. No. Come on, they're watching you when you go to the store. Yes. They're watching you. Amen. And they're thinking, oh, you're supposed to be a Christian, oh, so you only dress, that's only, that's only, that's only, that's only how y'all do it at church? Because that's how we do. You know when you go to Walmart, you see people in the store with their pajamas and their bonnets on their head? Yeah. Oh, y'all don't got Walmarts up here, do y'all? It's, it's Target? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, you know that's what they thinking. Oh, yeah, we just dress anyway when we go to the store, too. So y'all just like us. So they're watching you. God says, I have much people in this city, much people to get saved, much people to get encouraged, much people to repent and get back into God's family and get back into fellowship, get back, much people to be encouraged and, and much people to do much work. It speaks of, uh, the presence of God speaks of, it. listen, you need God's power in your life. You need the power of God. Paul had the power of God in his life, and they knew it, and that's why they were mad at Paul, because he had something that did, they did not have. The same way Satan is mad as you, you have something that he does not have. Listen, you, you taking his position. Uh, uh, Paul had a position from God. You, your job is to worship God. You have a position that Lucifer no longer has. Listen, you get to represent the person of God, and, and he, all you have to do is yield and allow him to work through you. That's all you have to do is yield and allow God to work through you. And the person of God will just work in your life. You have been saved. The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. Not, hey, that's wrong. We, let's not go there. We don't need to go there. Ain't nothing like somebody to remind you of how stupid you are. <laughs> It's nothing like it, because you know you get to thinking you, there's ideas. In, I say it all the time. There was people when they was 19 and 20, and it was like, and when you know, whoever their high school sweetheart was, <laughs> and he didn't want to, he didn't like him no more. He didn't want to call him no more because 
he stupid as they is, and dudes grow, it take dudes longer to mature than females. <laughs> we don't care nothing about that stuff y'all care about. Y'all 19, 20, we want to get married, we got plans, all that, we not thinking about none of that. <laughs> and you're trying to, trying to get our minds to think about it, we can't. <laughs> we're not even ready to think about it. We're thinking about what we're thinking about. <laughs> so you're in high school, you're 19, you're 20, and say, if we, I can marry this person, if we be together, we'll make the beautiful kids and the sweetest family and all that, all this stuff that you didn't, you didn't come up with. It's, TV told you that, but yeah. it's a lie. Yeah. And then when they ain't talking to you, you in the house crying, sick, and <laughs> like you about to die. Fast forward 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, you see them in a story like, oh, baby, thank God. <laughs> I wonder where I got that idea from. <laughs> Had that thing went down, it would be bad. <laughs> thank God you have the spirit of God to say, no, 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 no. We won't be doing that. To remind you, you remember the last time you thought of one of these, it, you had egg on your face. We're not doing that again. Listen, uh, this Bible, take your Bible to, to the book of Daniel. Listen, we just gonna go over a couple of people that had God, just God was with them. And it, but for the presence of God, Daniel chapter one, you should know the verse by heart. If you don't, learn it. It'll help you. The Bible says when, when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar had the king that came to Babylon, unto, came from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king Judah, into his hand, which part of the vessel, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. Notice his God is different from the God of the Bible. Amen. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. That's there for a reason. You read it later on in Daniel. Those vessels in God's house was very precious. Every vessel in God's house is very precious. Amen. Now you do understand that you are about to be, you're supposed to be a vessel of, a, a vessel of, of, of righteousness. That's what you are. You're one of God's vessels. You're precious to him. And you're not to be used to worship the world or worship false gods, or you're not to be shown off to, as some like little trinket. Hear what I said. Yes. You're not the world's little trinket. So stop allowing the world to uh, trumpet you and strumpet you all over the place. The Bible in verse four says, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and science and such as had ability to them that stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach learning and, tongue, and the tongue of the Chaldeans. When they came to besiege the town, they looked for the very best. Uh -huh. yes, sir. Uh -huh. They looked for the very best. And the Bible says David and the three Hebrew boys didn't have no blemish in them. And when it came time for, see, when you have the presence of God, you have a little experience with God. When you've seen God work in your life, it gives you a little confidence. They call it cockiness or arrogance. You call it whatever you want to, but you better, be, you better keep it. When you got experience with God, you've seen God work in your life, the Satan is trying to steal that from you. He's trying to tell you that God ain't coming in for you. He ain't going to help you this time. He ain't with you this time. The Bible says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince, the eunuch, eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. And the Bible says, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince and the, of the eunuchs. Listen, you want God to bring you into favor and tender love and to, in the eyes of everybody that's above you. Everybody that's your mom, dad, uh, aunts, uncles, or your boss, everybody that has charge over you, you want to, God to bring you into favor and tender love before them so they can say, I don't even like these kids. I can't stand them. But I, something different about them. Yes. 
David, D Daniel, Daniel right here. Daniel, uh, at, at, in the Bible says, uh, verse 17, he says, and as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. See, God gives you some extra special when he's with you. Now, you need to be faithful to that when God's presence shows up. You know who the eunuch knew? Yeah. Eunuch had been around long enough. He said, they got something that the other ones don't. And when Daniel asked for the special request, he, he had enough sense like, hey, listen, I need to figure out what their secret is. You know, when people see your kids and they're clean, see kids, they don't understand when their parents raising them up in the admonition and nurturing of the Lord. Because, you know, you get 13 and you get stupid and then you get uh, and then you get 19 and you know everything. and Your parents can't be right. They don't know what they're talking about. And they don't know that their the blessing is that their kids rose, res, rode, read, uh, raised them up in the admonition and nurturing of the Lord. Yeah. They don't understand that. Listen, these four was different. The Bible says uh, those four, listen, David had his turn and then the, the uh, three Hebrew boys had their turn. Uh, it, it, the, the but if not moment. And, and Daniel chapter 2 and verse 17, the Bible said, then Daniel went to his house and made, made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of God, of heaven, concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. D Daniel just spent some time with him like, hey, listen, we got God. And then guess what? They had the but if not moment. If God deliver us or not, he's still God. You know you should have that moment. If God, it don't matter if God deliver us or not. If, are we still going with God? The Bible talks about David in the cave. David, you know, he, get, he got lonely in the cave. He was God's man. God was with him, but God was with him. But he, you know what he realized? It's lonely at the top. And everybody's got to, they, when you start serving a God, you have a target on your back. And you know, God allowed them to put that target on the back to see if you're going to be faithful and keep going. Yes, you're right. David, when the 400 men had turned on him, the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Uh, when David was on the run, take your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2. No, 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. David's on the run. You think that after he, you know, he, he, his problem was once after he established the kingdom, he loosened his belt. He got comfortable. He, just, he forgot he was still in the warfare. I, I'm at 2 Kings and I, I got 2 I got it all my second time and I turned from it. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. The Bible says, and there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. So he didn't deal with his son. So his son stole the hearts of the men in, uh, in the kingdom. Uh, listen, the Bible says you need to beat your child. Sometimes you got to beat the stupidity out of him. <laughs> they talk about Joab. Joab knew what Absalom needed. Now, I'm sorry that he got in trouble. He, he got in trouble because of it, but he knew what Absalom needed. You know why? Because it was his cousin. Yeah. First cousin. Yeah. First cousin. He knew what his cousin, he, 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 he was raised up with her. And listen, he knew, he knew a little bit about, more about David than most folks think they did. David raised them. The Bible says that David said unto all his servants and, and that were with him at Jerusalem, rise, let us flee. Not from the presence of the Lord, from a dangerous situation. Sometimes you're going to be in some dangerous situations and God said, you just got to get out of here. For we shall not escape from the Absalom, make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring, us evil, bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. He knew that if he stayed there, Absalom might kill everybody that was on David's side. And be bloodshed and people, wouldn't, people that didn't need to die would have died. And he fled. But you know what he knew? He had God's presence. And he prayed, God, make, make Ahithophel's counsel. Switch it. You know, and Ahithophel was just bitter because, you know, 
you mess with the you mess with the grandbaby, you know what I'm saying? He he better. You, you, think about it. I say it all the time. You know when he's when when the, the strong strong dad and all of that get the grandbaby, and the kid's mad because he's treating the grandbaby better than he, the kids feel like he's treating the grandbaby better than he treated them. Grandkids do something to you. They just do something to you. Be the hardest person in the world, grandkids. I, 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 I am in Lima, and Lima, they got a lot of mixed couples. And I'm telling you, when I see these old white granddads with their mixed grandbabies, they'll kill you about their grandbabies. And I know some previous history about them. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't look too kindly on this type of stuff. You know how when you see God just like throw a little monkey wrench in there because he got a sense of humor. <laughs> Thump your Bible now. <laughs> it don't work. The Bible says also that uh, 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 when they, they went on a run, uh, let's take it to 2 Kings and we'll, we'll stop right there. Let's go to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, this is Elisha. This is the Syrians. He's about to deal with the Syrians. And the Bible says, And the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware thou shalt not pass no such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Listen, they, when you, even when you're not right with God, God always send a man to help you. He sends one of his men because when he loves you, he loves Israel. They can talk, I don't care what they tell you on the news. He loves Israel and ain't nothing changing. It don't matter who come up with what policy and what new land grant or deal they come up with. He loves Israel and his book is always going to be true. The Bible says, and the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware not, he warns him. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved him there, himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? So he think he's got a traitor in the camp. You don't need a traitor in the camp. When you got the God of the universe, he already know what's going on. See, sometimes you got to stop seeking counsel from the world and stop trying to link up with the world and try to be friends with the world. And you got a book. Amen. The brother told you last night, you want to you knock on the door of heaven? Get on your knees and pray. You know what God responds to? He responds to his word. He responds to your obedience. He responds to your faithfulness. That's what he responds to. And he, does, he loved nothing better than to bless you and make something out of you that you can't take any glory for, but they will give him all the glory. The Bible says uh, in verse 12, and one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, tell of the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Now you, listen, if you're the person that got to tell a king that, you should be scared. <laughs> But guess what he was worried about? He was more scared of Elisha, yeah. God's man. People in the world need to be scared of you. They should be scared of you. They should see that you got some wisdom that they can't overthrow. They should see that you got some, uh, uh, some of God's, uh, something of God on you where you can see that something's wrong with this thing. I mean, dude, he's like, man, this, I, I, he, I know he was probably like, man, let's go take over somebody else. Let's go get somebody else. Let's leave them alone, because Elisha might have, he, he might get me next. Won't you go out there and get him, king? And then he says, he said, go and spy where he is, that I might send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Now listen, who, I, I don't know who it is that they sent on this, this kamikaze mission. <laughs> But I was like, man, he told if he if he know what you are doing and telling us, and he hears what you said in your bedchamber, you think he ain't heard you now? Yes. 
And the Bible says, therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great army, a great host and that came by night and compassed the city of Rock. That came by night. <laughs> Cowards. The Bible says the wicked flee with no, no man pursue. They cowards. That's what cowards do. They go get a big posse, a whole bunch of people to jump on one little Christian. And Christian, you take your Bible and say, this is what the Bible say. Some, some of you, you might have been snapping in vertebrae, but snap it in. But at some point in time, that vertebrae, that it should stiffen up because I got the spirit of God with me. I got God, I got God on my side. I don't have to be no spineless jellyfish. Amen. The Bible never said that Elisha was worried or shaking in his boots. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible says that when the servant of the man of God was risen early because he he don't have the experience that Elisha has with God being with him. Yeah. He don't know that the spirit of God, God's power, God's presence brings protection. He don't understand that part. He sees some things, but it ain't, you know how your kids have to, the God of, the God of your parents has to become your, your God. Amen. It has to become personal. Yeah. Elisha has a personal relationship with God. He knows God is there. He's not worried about God leaving him because he knows he's right with God. And the Bible says, they had, he says, he says, and God, he risen, God had, the man of God was risen early and going forth and behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and his servants and said unto him, at last, my master, how shall we do? Now, the servant is looking at all of these people. He's looking at the chariots. He's looking at the horses. He's looking at everything. It, it ain't even bothered Elisha. Yeah. The Bible says, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So if there go your link, well, we have much people in this city. It's just the people, the much people we got in this city are supernatural. They're not from this world. They come down from heaven. And the job that we're doing is much more important than what they're doing. And they're mad because I know their business. You know, that's what the world get mad about when you Christians, you don't have to know their business. You just got to preach what God tell you to preach, and it'll seem like you know their business. They'll come to church like, did you tell a preacher my business? No, it's just the presence of God. And the Bible says, and Elisha prayed, said, and prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes at the young man, of the young man that he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and of chariots of fire. Round about Elisha. God's got much people in the city. He's got much people in the city for you to see saved. For you see them get, for you see them repent. Much Christians to get right back with the Lord. Much, much people in the city to do all of these things. But he's got much people in the city to protect you when you're doing what God told you to do. Listen, you need God's presence with you. All right, come on, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, the altar's open. The altar's open. Uh, it, we have much on our side. We have much on our side. I don't know if any of you are going through a discouraging time. I don't know if you feel like you're the only one. I don't know if you feel like that you've lessened or you're belittled. But I think that if you feel like that, you must know there is still much, yes. much in your city. With every head bow and every eye shut and the altar call is open, I want to give you this moment to pray to the Lord. and. I know you feel like much is against you. That is the tendency. I was talking to some uh, preachers and some Bible believers, but they feel like much is against them. Hey, you young people, uh, there, uh, you might think that there is much against you and your mom and dad don't know about it. Your own church might not know about it. Pastor, you might think that much is against you and then no other pastor friend or anybody in your church, maybe even your family, don't know about it. 
I mean, I, I'm guilty of that. There are still times that I would sometimes feel that. But we have much on our side, not against us. We have so much more for us that is against those who are against us. There is so much for us, and we need to come before the throne. We need to have our eyes open, knocking on heaven's door. How's your relationship with Jesus Christ? You read that book? You pray? Well, I do that, preacher. Maybe the Lord puts you through some things to open up some more things in the spiritual realm. Deepen his relationship his bond with you. Quite often that is the case through sufferings or trials or tests he put us through. And it's through those blessed, yes, blessed, treasured moments. Our relationship has bonded far closer and we realize there's so much. <laughs> so much that can lift us up. I serve such a great God. So many times I say that, but I don't even know the meaning of what I just said. Of how great my God is. You're not alone. You're not alone. The Lord has given you Maybe, maybe just a couple hours, maybe just a couple days in this meeting. But he's shown you physically here, physically, if you can't really see spiritually. He's giving you a little glimpse through the physical realm here. There's much. There's much sitting next to you. There's much around you. There's much. When you go to heaven, 10 billion times more. You'll see much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How much of the blessings of God, how much of his presence and power and so much on our side, on our side, and even in this city, in this wicked, God-forsaken area, no matter how small you feel you, feel you are, there is much. Don't miss those justice, those people whose houses are tied to the synagogue. Don't miss those blessed treasured moments to remind you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Yes. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that there is much on our side. Uh, Lord, I've, my cup is already overflowing. There's so much. Uh, Lord, I can't wait for so much more. Will you please fill within our next speakers, Lord? Every preacher is so different, unique, because their walk and their lives are all different, and it's so amazing and beautiful how you've used every different chord of the instrument to play a beautiful tune. And may that tune continue, and may we see your Holy Spirit moving amongst our hearts and get something right with you. Continue to work on our hearts. Help this to be a permanent thing that we can take back in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll give you a ramen donut break.